Yes, hooray. I'm so happy. I am too. Um, so, derivatives. Uh, so, maybe I'll start writing what a derivative is, just to remind ourselves. Um, feels like I should. Um, so if f is a function, the derivative, which we write f prime, f, um, f apostrophe, because we don't say f apostrophe for some reason, is this limit of the increment in the function as uh, uh, divided by the increment in the variable. And then we make that limit as the increment gets very small. Um, so um, the next thing I have to talk about is other, other notations for the same thing. So um, the thing is, we like to write um, to um, to write the uh, function as a different variable often, where y equals f of x. So um, we we also you see y prime. Um, that's pretty common to see, and other stuff that are pretty common to see is to um, just see, see the derivative written like this, which I guess we read the f dx. Um, so um, also you might see the y dx. Um, you might see d dx of f. Uh, this is called uh, Leibniz notation. And it means the exact same thing. Uh, it's just a different way of writing the exact same thing. Um, <clears throat> so, okay. I feel like when I get to this point, I have to talk about the um, talk about the T you know, because um, that's the many interesting things uh, happen, and this one is pretty interesting. So, calculus was invented by by two two people um so calculus was invented by this weirdo okay um oh you're here by this freaking weirdo newton who did a lot of impressive math in his life and also was probably freaking unbearable as a person. So he invented it, um, he called it Fluxions. I don't know how you pronounce that. F-L-U-X-I-O-N, Fluxions, Fluxions. Uh, and what did he do with his invention? He put it in a drawer and didn't tell anyone about it. So um, a few years went by, I have no idea how many, 10. And this other guy, Famous, first of all, for wearing these insane wigs. Um, I mean, that's that's this is big achievement by far. Like, look at the look at the thing. Look at the wig. Holy crap! Uh, also famous for being a philosopher and writing writing nonsense that doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, also invented the same thing and wrote it um, wrote derivatives as the DFDX and published it. So this is this is like bigger than the, the Kanye West, Taylor Swift thing, honestly. Uh, publishes it, uh, and, and then uh, Newton goes, well, this guy must have stolen my ideas that I kept in secret. This is the only explanation for how this happened. And then they argue for like 17 years, which is, um, so they argued, and it must have been it must have been endurable because they didn't 
you know, they didn't have Instagram Live, so probably they were being equally annoying, but on letter, probably. Oof. Uh, and in the end, so basically, Newton was English, Leibniz was German. Uh, so English people wanted to say that an English person invented the thing. Uh, German people wanted to say that it was a German. French people, I don't know what they thought. Uh, they probably said it with the Germans because um, same side of the English Channel. Uh, and and guess who won? So this is on freaking Wikipedia page. It, it's super interesting. It's just old white dudes with wigs throwing shit at each other. It's great. And the method of fluxions and fluence. And uh, the winner in the end was clearly uh, Newton, because if you see here, uh, Leibniz died like nine years before. And if you die, you lose. Now they're both dead, so that's what they got from it. Um, anyway, if you were wondering if, um, for some reason, you were wondering if, if these people the inventors of this shit weren't terrible people who would just spend the day teasing instead of doing anything useful with their lives. Um, now you know. <clears throat> Hope my microphone was on the whole time. So this is Lemmy's notation, um, and there's just, I mean, you should know what it is because you're going to see it a lot in your life. Um, the important thing you should know is that this is not a fraction. Um, you can't, you can't go like, um, well, you can't cancel, first of all, you can't cancel the Ds, um, but you can't really go like this. Uh, and you know, multiply by dx as if as if um, this meant something. So um, so I would advise you to not do this. Um, I would advise you to treat the FDX as just one symbol that looks exactly like a fraction, but it's not. The reason, so the reason it looks like a fraction um, is that when when these people were invented, inventing this stuff, what they went is they, they literally went like, um, take an increment in Y and take an increment in X and I don't know if they use the word limit, but um, what they said was literally make it infinitely small and then you're going to get a derivative. So they would say that the derivative is the quotient of an infinitely small thing by an infinitely small thing. Now, I don't know what they meant by infinitely small. They didn't know. And then a couple hundred years went by and people started like producing very wrong math out of saying things could be infinitely small and you could divide infinitely small things. And then is when people invented limits. Um, limits like you see in section 2.4 of the book, which I skipped. Um, and then for a while people stopped doing raw math. Um, and, and then after that, uh, people invented other ways to interpret what df or dx could mean that are definitely not part of this course. Um, so, and, and, and then I write df dx and I think of it as meaning the same thing as the derivative and definitely not a division of two things. Just, you know, um, uh, that said, you will see people treat it as a fraction. Um, Be careful <laughs> with that. So, okay. So, 
yeah, the reason for adding dx, dy, and dx, you know, somehow delta is uh, d in Greek, and you make the delta very small, it becomes into a d or something. So remember that this this literally meant y at x plus h minus y of x, so the change in y divided by the change in x. So, and the change in x is just h. So this is just a derivative. But anyway, um, Leibniz notation is pretty common and you should know about it and you should know it's not a fraction. Okay, are there any questions? So whenever it's like the d of f over d of x is just it's another way of saying like f of like x plus h minus f of it, x over h. With the limit, yeah. So basically I would write things like um, Um, so I would write things like ddx, so this is what we computed yesterday, ddx of the square root is 1 over root x, so this is the same, is the same as writing root x prime equals 1 over 2 root x, for example, or you could say d. Something I really wrote something right now. What the hell? What did I just do? D, you would write things like this. Um, this is the same as saying that x squared prime equals two x. So. You can just basically, you can write the same information in one way or the other. Sometimes you have a huge formula and you want to take a derivative of it. It's more, it's clearer to write DDF, DDX in front of it than to write a prime all the way in the corner. Um, for you, it doesn't matter. Use whichever you want. Um, but they both, uh, they both mean the exact same thing. So like uh, when you have that notation, you don't have to put the word limit. It's just understood to be the limit. Well, in both of them, so in both of them, the, the limit is understood. Um, so here I write a prime on the on the left. I write a prime. I don't write any any limit. And here, you know, this is also d d f d f d x. Um, neither of these. Uh, have the word limit in there. So in both of them, it's understood. Okay. okay. So, um, so, um, so next up is talking about um, just the notion that derivatives might or might not exist. So, um, so a function, basically we say a function is differentiable if the derivative exists, because um, we should keep in mind that derivatives don't have to exist um, because there are limits and limits like to not exist sometimes. Um, we say, yeah, is, Differentiable I don't feel like writing. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we say if it's differentiable at A if F prime F prime of 
directly exists. And we say F is differentiable on an interval. On the interval AV, if F prime of X exists for every X, um, in the interval. So um, we already know one, one example where the derivative fails to exist, which was the square root um, that we saw yesterday. This, um, this function, its domain doesn't include zero. Uh, and that's gonna be because the square root is not differentiable at zero. But for example, the, for example, the square root is differentiable uh, on, on all the positive numbers. Um, every, every number between zero and infinity uh, the derivative exists, um, and the derivative of zero does not exist, um, if you remember from yesterday. <clears throat> because we computed that limit, and we saw that the limit does not exist. If you, if you look at your notes from yesterday, you will see over here, we, we were doing the derivative of, of the square root, which is this limit. And after some simplifying, we reached this point. And here, if x is 0, well, I mean, this is the answer you get every time. If x is zero, this is not an answer because you divide by zero. Um, so uh, this limit does not exist. Uh, so the derivative does not exist. Um, well, that's just great. Um, It's not differentiable uh, at x equals zero. Okay, so let's do another example. Um, so basically, to find to see if a function is differentiable, you need to well find the derivative basically. And if you can't find it, that means it's not differentiable. Um, when we're doing these type of um, problems, will they like use brackets and stuff? Will they use brackets? Yeah, you know how like in interval notation, like you write like bracket of zero to positive infinity that includes zero. Oh. These kind of brackets. Like this, is this what you mean? I think she means like um um close brackets for like interval notation. Oh. And when you have like a dom like when you use the domain for something and you have like closed brackets versus open, like uh, well, you can use brackets. Basically, the answer for this kind of problem is give me a, a set of real numbers. So um, you can give an answer. You know, you can give an answer in more than one way. You, so what I said for the square root, um, what I say for the square root, um, I wrote as an interval pretty useful, but I could have just said it in words by saying it's differentiable when x is positive. Um, you no, know, saying, uh, saying when x is positive has the exact same meaning. Normally, so this is not the case in for every function, literally every function, but, oh, that's what you meant. Um, but normally, 
um, uh, functions are going to tend to be differentiable at uh, most points, and then you, they're going to be they're going to be a few where uh, everything where they break. Kind of, I mean, this is this is again not the case all the time, but norm, the kind of functions you usually see, <clears throat> they have a few bad points. Just like if you see a function and I ask you where it's continuous, this function is continuous everywhere except for at the obvious bad points. Um, and if I drew this function and I, I asked you where it's differentiable, it's also going to be differentiable everywhere except for, you know, and negative one and one. So brackets are not, interval notation is not essential, but probably, I mean, still probably useful. Okay, so here's an example with the other kinds of brackets. Um, where is uh, the absolute value, our favorite function, differential? So, um, so this is, okay. We somehow broken this down. So this is the graph of the absolute value. It's y equals x. The absolute value is the same, returns the same number for a positive input and returns the opposite for a negative input. So the opposite of a negative number is positive, always returns a positive number. So it looks like two straight lines forming an angle. Uh, and this should be this should be helpful for guessing where the derivative should exist. But let's let's just do it and and see uh, see what happens, and then look at it on the picture. So um, the derivative of the absolute value, which I can write like this. So this means the exact same thing as take the absolute value into the derivative. Another nice thing about Leibniz notation is if you have extra letters floating around some, somehow, you um, you can you can say what you're taking the derivative, which one is the variable. Like if I write this, you know, the variable is x. If I write this, you well, you go. There's only one letter, so the variable is x. But you're not. What if it was x plus a? You know. Anyway, the derivative. The only way we know how to compute it yet is this is the limit. Okay, let's say to approach zero of the function evaluated at x plus h minus a function at x divided by h. Um, and this is the same as the limit. Uh, so now I plug in the function. So if, if f is the absolute value, then I need to put x plus h into the absolute value and x into the absolute value. Um, OK, so this is the limit I'm supposed to compute. And this limit kind of nasty because there's not much algebra you can do with the absolute value. Uh, so basically, the absolute value, your only option is to distinguish uh, cases, asking where is the thing in the absolute value positive when it's in negative. So um, we will have that the absolute value will equal x or negative x, depending depending on whether 
whether x is positive or x is negative. And I have an extra problem with the x plus h. Um, so basically, I should distinguish these two cases. Um, so I should do these separately. Um, basically think of the absolute value like this and then think I should look at positive x's and negative x's separately so um, so what happens is positive. So if x is positive, um, then the absolute value of x is just itself. And the derivative is the limit. Well, it was this limit. I said the absolute value of x is just itself. So I can replace the absolute value by just x. And now what happens to x plus h? So I know, so what I know about h is that it's close to zero. And I know that x is positive. So the question is, is x plus h positive or negative? Well, what do I know? I know x is positive. And, and fixed, you know, uh, uh, taking the limit as h approaches zero, um, that means that x doesn't do anything. As x, uh, x is just there. I, I can think of it as a number that's not gonna change as I do the limit. And um, what I know about h is that h is approaching zero. h is, is tiny, could be positive or negative, we definitely, we're not taking the limit on one side. We're taking the, we're trying to take the limit on both. But if I take a tiny number plus a fixed positive number, that's gonna that's gonna give me a positive number. You know, if you tell me even if even if x is you know, if you tell me x is two, then I go, well as soon as h becomes smaller than one, x plus h is gonna be positive. Uh, the one and bigger than negative one. Right, so in the number line, x is here, x is positive, and h is going to be very small. So everything in here is positive. So um, since x plus h is positive, I know what its absolute value looks like. It's just the same number. So here I can write x plus h minus x. So what's the value of this limit? Oh, come on. I've seen you do harder limits in the homework, way harder limits. I have a lot of faith in you right now. One, yeah, it's one. Thank you, Sydney. Uh, uh, so the x's, there's an x adding and an x uh, subtracting that cancel out. And then h over h, well, whatever h is, the number divided by itself is one. And the limit of a constant function, if you like, this is, a limit law, the limit of a constant function is, is just a constant. So the derivative of, of 
the absolute value is just one for when I look at positive numbers. And I should look at negative numbers now, and then I should look at zero. So if I look at negative numbers, uh, it's going to be exactly the same, except with, except for a minus sign. So um, I'm doing I'm doing the same limit. I'm doing the derivative. divided by h and now I, I wonder since I said x was negative let me write the write the absolute value in a better way uh, x is negative means that the absolute value of x is its opposite remember negative x is not a negative number is if x is negative if x is negative 1, then negative x is positive 1. And also, if h approaches 0, this means that x plus h is going to be negative as well. Eventually. So, the absolute value of x plus h is in its opposite. And be careful with the brackets, or you'll get wrong answers. So both absolute values are just the opposite function. So now I'm accumulating two, two negative signs in there. And when the dust clears, I have negative x minus h. And here I have two negative x's, so that's positive. Those are absolute value signs in limit function. Uh, yeah. Can you scroll down a little bit? And still. Oh. Oh shit. No. Wait. Um. The answer is no, but I can do this. Can I? Wait. Give me a second. Um. That's in the screen now. Thanks, Pascal. Um, okay, so those are indeed absolute values. Uh, so, okay. Maybe I run them in blue. The blue ones are absolute values. And the black ones are brackets. <clears throat> okay, so what's this limit? Negative one. Negative one. Thank you very much. Oh, Sydney again, right? Thank you very much. Um, uh, just like before, um, the x's cancel because they're subtracting, and then uh, I guess there's a danger here that if you try to do it in your head, you cancel the H's first, which doesn't work, and then you cancel the X's. And then you might get zero uh, if you if you if things go wrong in your head. But if I'm doing it carefully like I am, this is just the limit of the constant function negative one. And this is negative one. I think this probably shouldn't be surprising looking at the picture. Uh, or maybe in retrospect it's not with respect, it's not surprising because the slope of this literal line, the, the tangent line to this line should be the slope of, well, it's a, it's a line. The tangent, the tangent to a line should be just itself. And I know it has slope one because it's the line y equals x and the same on this other side. Um, okay, so that uh, tells me what the derivative is for positive numbers and for negative numbers. So now for the interesting bit, the interesting bit is what happens uh, for for zero. So 
So what happens for zero? So now, oh, I forgot. I'm trying to do the derivative of of the absolute value when x equals zero. This means the same thing as f prime of zero, f prime of zero. Um, so the function is the absolute value, remember. So um, if this notation, this is something people use with like this notation, this means tzx, uh, the derivative of absolute value, and then make um, x equals zero. In other words, um, the derivative at zero. Um, so when you when you work when you use Leibniz notation like this, there's really no place to write the points you're evaluating at, which is why we have to write. Um, we have to write it like that somewhere else. Okay, so um, so this is the derivative of zero. So the derivative, um, once again, for the last time, it's this formula over here. And, but, but now I'm making x equals zero. So this means, um, well, x equals, zero, x equals zero. What's the actual value of zero? What's the absolute value of zero? Zero. Zero. Matthew. Thank you. Oh, if I don't look in time, I don't see your name lighting up. So I don't know who, who helped me, but thank you. Anonymous benefactor. The absolute value of zero is zero. The absolute value of a positive number um, is itself the absolute value of a negative number. Is its opposite, the absolute value of zero is zero. Uh, zero plus h is h, and and this is just zero. So now I'm looking. Now I just have a function, the absolute value of h divided by h, and I'm trying to, and I'm trying to compute its limit. So it's a it's a limit problem now. Um, with no no x floating around, nothing strange. Uh, just and that's the absolute value. So what is this limit? How do I do it? What do I do? Here. What do you think the answer is going to be? Does not exist. Oh, that's the right guess. So it, it's not going to exist. So how do we show? Why do we think it doesn't exist? Or how do we show it? Plug in zero for h. Well, that's a that's a good thing to try. But um, if we plug in zero for h, we get zero divided by zero, which doesn't mean doesn't mean that if you get zero divided by zero, that doesn't mean that the limit does not exist. It means you don't know, but it could be zero divided by zero and exist, like a bunch of derivatives. Okay. So I'm going to go in order. Matthew says it's a sharp cut. And I don't know if you mean, I don't know which graph, the graph, I don't know which graph you mean. Uh, I'm going to, I think I'm going to go back to that. If we graph it, so, I mean, if we, and then Dustin said, are we going to have to do H and negative H, like we did for the absolute value of X. And that is what we're going to have to do as far as uh, ideas go. So, um, I mean, this is the only idea I have. So this is the function we're trying to do the limit of. And if you look at the graph, it's just one on the right and negative one on the left. Um, it, it clearly looks like it has no limit at zero. Uh, but 
the way to show this, looking at this graph, clearly seems like it's um, show that from the right it's just one and from the left it's just negative one. And then we're gonna have limits that don't agree. So let's go do that. So um, let's do the limit from the right of this thing. The limit from the right, well, if h is positive, that means that the absolute value of h is itself. So this is the limit of h divided by h, and I know you know this limit, this is just the limit of one. Like the picture was showing, for a positive number, this function is just one. And for a negative number, uh, well, guess what? It's going to be negative one. So basically, every time you have an absolute value, the way to do anything with it almost all the time is going to be to split it into cases and say if the thing inside is positive, then it's itself. And if the thing inside is negative, then it's the opposite. It's annoying because it means you do double the work for the same pay, but then again, the pay for doing this was zero dollars to begin with. Um, but at least we know we know where this ends. So this is now negative h divided by h, which is negative one, just like the graph was showing the constant function negative one. So we have a limit on the left and on the right that are different. So this limit does not exist. So the derivative of a zero does not exist. Um, and so, okay. So that's the, that's the answer. Absolute value is not differentiable. Are there any questions? Okay, uh, let's let's look at the graph, see if we understand what's going on. So here's the function we were looking at, the absolute value. And here's the derivative that we or, that we just computed, the derivative of the absolute value. Oh, I didn't write the whole formula. The derivative of the absolute value is um, one if x is positive, negative one if x is negative, and it, it's not equal to anything, is that it doesn't, it doesn't exist if x is zero. So y equals one is a horizontal line, it's this horizontal line, y equals negative one is this horizontal line, and then in the middle there's, there's a gap. So what this is telling us, what, what we're seeing here, is that um, anywhere on the right hand side of the of the of the drawing, this has slope equal to one. If I go two squares to the right, I go as many squares up. Uh, and that means that, so slope equals one everywhere it means uh, height, height equal to one, the height of the derivative. Over here, I have that when I go one to the right, I go uh, negative one down. So this has slope negative one. And well, everywhere here, the derivative uh, takes a value negative one. Now, what happens in the, in the middle? In the middle, what happens is that there's no, so what's the tangent line? 
um, the tangent line, I feel like I could say that this is ten. I feel like I could say that this is tangent. I feel like I could say that this is tangent. I feel like I could say that. Could I say that this is tangent? I maybe. I don't. I don't know. Um, I feel like a lot of there's a lot of lines I could say are tangent. I feel like I could say none of them are tangent. And the the answer the answer we go with is that um, nothing. N none of these are tangent. There's no tangent. Uh, no line. Uh, no line is tangent to this to a corner, basically. Um, and one reason to to make this claim to decide that um, nobody deserves to be called tangent is that if there's many possible answers, there, there might as well be none. Uh, just working with things that have multiple answers, it's super annoying. Um, but another reason is that when you have a differentiable function, like the sine, for example, oh, like the sine, you zoom in, oh, look, this one happens to be tangent. Look, you zoom in at a point and it just looks like a line. It looks like the tangent line. But if you look at the absolute value, uh, you zoom in and you zoom in and you zoom in and you zoom in. And what does it look like? It, look, it always looks like the exact same corner. It's never going to look like a line. So when a function doesn't look like a, a line close to a point, we, we tend to say, we say that it's not differentiable. And you can tell in a picture because um, corners make you not differentiable. Um, any questions? So, if you think of the functions you know and they're in the graphs, um, almost none of them have corners. So, um, what's another thing? So we said, so, how else can a function not be differentiable? How can, what, what kind of drawings can you think of where the tangent line doesn't exist? So, all right, uh, so far we have a corner. Can you think of any other situation where it wouldn't make sense to draw a tangent line? Oscillations. I'm gonna I'm gonna interpret your your answer in the way that I want to interpret it. Um, I don't know. Hopefully, I don't know what exactly you mean. But if you have something like this and it goes nuts, it goes nuts like like sine of one over x, which is not continuous. Then over here. How the hell am I going to define a tangent line? Um, it's just, it's not going to work. That is correct. Can you think of other ways? Other bad things you've seen happen to functions, which would probably stop it from having a derivative. Just regular something divided by x, like okay, like one divided by x. Um, so, what is the so one divided by x? Is this graph? 
So what is the tangent at zero? The answer is that it doesn't have it. Uh, constant functions or constant functions have tangent lines. Um, you can do the, that derivative just by you doing the limit y equals one. A, a line has a tangent line. It's just itself. Um, okay, so since uh, we all want to start with our weekend, well, you want to start with your weekend. I have to talk about your homeworks with some people. Um, what do these have in common? What they have in common is that uh, these are not continuous. Another example of a function that is not going to have a tangent is, a, is something with a jump, which is another typical way of not being continuous. How, how do you define the tangents here? Those, that's not going to work. Uh, so another example is if you, so basically if you're not continuous, um, you're not differentiable. And more on that on Monday. All right. So that's all. Um, YouTube outro. Have